Have you read your bulletin? Do you know what the sermon title is? What is it? You shook your head, yes, what is it? As it was in the days of Noah. So whenever I said that to the Sabbath school member, have you seen the new book that's out? That kind of goes along with that movie, you know, Noah and the Flood? Well, yes, I have. In fact, this week I had a glass repaired in my house. And the two guys that came out from the glass company, uh, after they got through uh, repairing the glass, putting the new glass in, uh, I wrote them the check for the glass. And then I gave both of the guys one of these books, Noah. And they act, one of the guys says, oh, I, 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 I'm, I really want to go see that movie. Now, I wasn't promoting the movie. I said, if you really want to know what it's like, I think this book would be a good description. And so uh, that Sabbath school member said to me, well, I'd like to get one. Do you know how much they cost? Well, I, I told her what the cost was. And uh, she says, I can't afford that. You got a book. <laughs> uh, I gave a... I picked on her because I saw her coming out of the Sabbath school class this morning. Hadn't seen her before. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to tell you, it's important that we share what we believe. This is a really good book, by the way. And uh, uh, if you read the book, you don't have to listen to the sermon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to tell you this. I don't have time to tell you all of what's in the book. And so um, I want to get right to the message. And I'm going to ask that you pray for me that I bring out what is needed here this morning. Even though, even though some of you are not going to like it. I already know as I was studying that some of you are not going to like what I have to say. So uh, pray for me, pray for you. Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit lead us. Lord, whatever words I say, somehow or another stop me from saying them if they're not in harmony with what your will is. On the other hand, if it needs to be said, give me the guts and the power to say it and say it right. Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will bless us as we look into the Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you now if you'll go to Luke chapter 17. And uh, while you're turning there to Luke 17, I'm just going to simply tell you that today I'm going to be using the New American Standard Bible, so it's going to read a little bit different than some of your Bibles, but uh, it's a pretty accurate uh, translation, uh, and uh, I'm going to read just a little bit. I'm going to read a section of Luke 17, and I'm going to start with verse 22, and I'm going to read down to uh, verse uh, 29. Or no, 30, verse 30. 22 to verse 30. Follow along with me, especially if you've got a different translation. Follow along with me because you might pick up on something that's a little bit different that might, might be helpful. Uh, Luke 17, beginning with verse 22. And he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away and do not run after them. For just as lightning, when it flashes out of the part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the coming, or, or so will the Son of Man be in his day. I'm almost, even as I'm reading this from the New American Standard, I'm almost filling it in with the old King James. Uh, it's kind of difficult, but follow me. Verse 25, but first 
he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And it was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating and they were drinking and they were building and they, or they were buying and they were selling and they were planning and they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Now, I've often looked at this and I've thought, as it was in the days of Noah, what is it about the days of Noah that would be helpful for me to know here in these last days just before Jesus comes? What, what is it that would really be helpful? Uh, and, and do I need to know the specifics of how the flood came? Is that what I need to know? Uh, do I need to know how they were living, uh, how they were relating to Noah? Is that what I need to know? Uh, what is it? Is Jesus is saying, as it was in the days of Noah. Now, they were doing some uh, very common things. Uh, all of us like to do some of these things. We like to eat. We're having fellowship lunch right after the service. We like to drink. Some like to drink maybe what they shouldn't drink. Some like to eat what maybe they shouldn't eat. It says that they were marrying. Certainly, there are times whenever uh, couples need to come together and get married. And, and then it says that they were giving in marriage. And, and you know what? Uh, I, I thought about that one a little bit, giving in marriage. Uh, one of the things that is being said recently is that, uh, oh, you know, our country is going bad. Do you know that there's already something like almost half of the states that are now recognizing marriage between homosexual couples? Oh, we're bad. Well, do you know, if, if it's something that uh, God does not condone and we keep silent, it's the same as if we're giving in that. And so uh, I, I thought about it that way. Uh, building. Sometimes buildings can be done wrong. In fact, it wasn't long after the flood that they built this great tower called Babel. You know, you can build and sometimes you can build on wrong principles whenever you're uh, trying to come up with a doctrine that is suitable for uh, helping you to know about Jesus. But then you can build on right principles as well. I think that our faith should be based on Jesus Christ. Now, I should have heard more amens than that. Our faith should be based on Jesus Christ, shouldn't it? The, the very basic foundation, cornerstone is Christ. And if we build, it should be built on him. Jesus even told a parable about that. You know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The rock, Jesus Christ. And so I'm looking at all of these things and I'm wondering, is that what I need to refer to? Whenever it says, as it was in the days of Noah. And I'm also looking back in the context here. And in verse 22, it says, The days shall come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. What does that mean? The day will come when you will wish that the Lord Jesus was watching over you all day long that day. Because there are some days you don't have those good days. I talked to my oldest sister last night on the telephone, and she says, we've been having a bad day here. I said, oh, what's the matter? 
Well, uh, during the middle of the day, a guy came in while we were there and stole some things. And uh, they didn't, they, they, they saw him go out of the house. And uh, whenever he went out of the house, they didn't really think to look at everything. But then uh, my niece got to looking around and uh, the wallet on the table was missing. And so she started to chase after him. And then she said, well, no, that's not a good idea. And so they immediately called the police. Police came, did a report. And the good news is they caught him down the street as he was doing the same thing at another house. They're having a bad day. Now then, not only are they unsettled about somebody coming into their house, but they're also unsettled about, oh, we're going to have to go to court and face this guy in court now. And so I think when Jesus was saying, you will be wishing for the day whenever Jesus is with you and things are going smoothly. You'll be wishing for the day that whenever you have a question, it will be answered according to the word. Some people look for answers and they look, I think, sometimes in the wrong places. So as it was in the days of Noah, go back to the Genesis account. And so I'm going to ask you to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, that's a little bit before the flood, but I want you to notice a couple of things. So Genesis, and be ready to follow with me, I'm going to be looking at Genesis 5 through about chapter 9, and I'm going to point out certain verses about the time of Noah. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generation of Adam. All right, so it starts talking about the generations that go down from Adam all the way down in, in Genesis 5. It goes all the way down to, uh, to Noah. At the end of chapter 5, if you notice in verse 32, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah be, uh, became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, I don't know what that means. Did he have triplets? He was 500 years old, and he has kids. Man, I was over at Niagara Falls on Mother's Day, and my son and his wife went on the Maid of the Myths. You know, the mothers got to ride free, and uh, so I'm, I'm holding the 10-month-old baby while they're riding on the Maid of the Myths, and I'm on the shore. But you know, after, you know how long it takes for that ride? If you're holding a baby, you'll know. <laughs> 15 minutes. Just 15 minutes. But if you hold a baby for 15 minutes when you're my age, your back begins to hurt a little bit, and then you begin to feel for these mothers. You know what I'm talking about? Uh... Anyway, I'm looking at this, and it's, it's telling the various ages uh, in chapter 5, verse 5, uh, the days of Adam was uh, 930 years, and he died. Now, in verse 27, uh, as you come down in a few generations, you find that all the days of Methuselah was 969. And then Noah, whenever he's 500 years old, has children. By the way, it doesn't say there how old Noah was. But if you really want to know how old Noah was, you can go over to chapter 9 and verse 29, and it says, So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. A long time. Man, that's a long time. Now, I'm reminded of Job's words in Job 14. He says, man comes forth 
like a flower and he flees away like a shadow. It says, uh, the longer he lives, the more trouble he sees. And so I'm thinking, well, one thing, they were living a little bit older back in those days. But you get into chapter 6, and it says that um, after man really began to multiply, you know, if I lived to be 500 years old, and I, would, and I had children when I was 500 years old, man, how many kids could I have? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> One wife's enough. A dozen kids for me is too much. But I'm going to tell you that, uh, you know, no wonder it says that uh, it, they begin to, to multiply on the earth. And notice in chapter 6, verse 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Um, what do you think about? If it's before lunch, you're thinking about eating, right? Right? Uh, if it's uh, you just drove up in front of our church and saw our lawn, I'm hoping somebody's thinking about mowing. Too much rain. Yeah? Uh, but the day will come. It'll dry out enough. We'll, we'll get it mowed. Uh, what do you think about? Well, those are a couple of little things, but if you mix in something evil, now, what can I say evil about the church lawn? Dandelions? Uh, I was thinking of something more subtle, something like the devil would use. You know, those deacons of the church, they're just no good. They don't keep the church lawn up like I think it should be. You've gone from talking about the lawn to criticizing somebody when you don't really know that it was too wet. That's the reason why they didn't mow it. You understand what I'm saying? So these people were in everything that they were doing, they were finding fault. They were thinking evil things. But I want you to notice something else in chapter six. I want you to notice that as you go down just a little bit in verse 8 of chapter 6, it's now somebody read it to me in the old King James because I, it reads a little different here. Noah found grace. grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you know that a person that is saved, they're saved by grace? Now, Back up there in verse 5, the thoughts of man was only evil continually. And I would suppose that Noah had some evil thoughts. But he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the earth was corrupt, verse 11, in the sight of God. And in the whole earth was filled with violence. Then you come down to chapter 7, and in chapter 7, uh, I find some interesting things. In uh, Genesis 7, verse 6, I want you to notice this. Now, Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came upon the earth. How old was Noah? 600 years old. Verse 11 Verse 11 of chapter 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. What does that mean? The flood began. 
It began above and below. The flood began. Now, I also have noticed that in verse 17, it says the flood came upon the earth for how long? 40 days. So it rained 40 days and nights. By the way, the night, whenever you look at the whole day, in the evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis says. So 40 days and 40 nights it rained. Now, how much rain did it take to flood Gowanda over there? Not 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> A couple of hours sometimes. Tonawana Creek. You live anywhere near that, Rob? Well, I'm glad you don't. I hear about it in the news every year. Uh, you know, floods, floods, floods. Well, I want you to notice that it rained 40 days. But I also want you to notice in verse 24, chapter 7, verse 24, the waters prevailed upon the earth, how long? 150 days. How long is 150 days? No, 150 days is how long? Five months. Five months. So, why do I believe it's five months? Because, notice chapter 8 and verse uh, 13. It says, now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the waters was dried up from the earth. And Noah removed a uh, covering from the ark and looked and behold, the surface of the ground, the surface of the ground was dried up. And in the second month, on the 27th day, verse 14 of the month, the earth was dry. Now that's in the 601st year. How long was Noah in the ark? By the way, uh, maybe I should uh, ask you to to go on to verse 15, it says, God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark and you and your wife and your sons and, and your sons' wives with you uh, and bring those, uh, those things, that, those living thing, creatures that's with you, bring them out of the ark. So how long was Noah and the animals in the ark? A year and 10 days. Remember? They went in on... Second month, 17th day, comes out on the 601st year. Second month, 27th day. 110 years. No, <laughs> 100. <laughs> I'm getting mixed up here. That's why you got to be watching the Bible. 100, how long? <laughs> One year and 10 days. One year and 10 days. One year and 10 days. Man, that had to be a smelly place. Uh, so, I'm looking in chapter 8, verse 4. The ark comes to rest on top of Mount Ararat. Uh, in verses 13 and 14, it's in the 601st year. Verses 15 and 16, God gives permission to Noah to leave. But I want you to notice something else in this flood story. Going back to Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. The very first time in the Bible, very first time in the Bible, it mentions that there are clean and unclean animals. Now, as it mentions it there, it says that the clean go in by sevens and the unclean go in by twos. Uh, and if you look in chapter 7 in verse 16, it says those that entered 
male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed the door behind them. Uh, I think King James Version says, and the Lord shut them in or sealed them in. God shut the door. Verse 17 of, of uh, chapter 7. I want you to notice something that is significant, especially as it relates to the last days. Verse 17 says this, it says, Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, uh, and it says, And the waters increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. Do you know? Do you know? Can you quote a last day text? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The Lord Himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, at the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the air to meet the Lord. The righteous remain alive and are caught up off the earth. I want you to notice something else. Verses uh, 22, chapter 7. It says, Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath or of the spirit of life died. All of the rest of them outside the ark on the face of the earth died. Oh, well, wait a minute, that text didn't say the face of the earth. I'm getting ahead of myself again. In verse 23, thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land. Now, let's be careful that we don't read into the Bible more than what the Bible says. The fish were in the waters, they weren't on the face of the ground. How did God, God didn't have to have an aquarium inside the ark. He didn't have to do that. It just says that those that were upon the earth, whenever it says upon the earth, that's on dry land. They died. So the fish he preserved another way. But I want you to notice in verse 23, and they were blotted out from the earth and only Noah was, was what? Alive or remained or left together with those that were with him in the ark. So, Sometimes we go to these texts in Matthew 24 and Luke 17 where it says two men are in the field or two women in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. The one that is taken, by the way, is the wicked. They're taken to destruction. In fact, we read the text in verse 27 where it said that uh, uh, the flood came and destroyed them all. But if you compare that with Matthew 24, the same text, it says that uh, uh, the flood came and took them all away. That's uh, Matthew 24, verse 39. So, one of the things, you know, we have this false rapture theory that's going around. And one of the things that they don't consider is uh, these details. But now, I want to pick on Adventists for a minute. Uh-oh. Now I'm going to get trouble. i got to figure out a way to get out of trouble here because I'm going to get in trouble with this one. Um, chapter 9, coming to the end of the flood narration. I want you to look very, 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 very careful, carefully at verses 3 and 4. Chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Keeping in mind, Luke says, 
as it was in the days of Noah. They were eating. So let's keep this in mind. It says in verse 3, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. Oh, man, I can eat anything. If I stop right there, maybe. And then it says, I give all to you as I gave the green plant. But verse 4, only you shall not eat what? Blood or flesh, it says in this, in this version. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. So, let me ask you this question. Was God saying you can't eat clean meat there? Was he saying you can't eat unclean meat there? He was saying you don't eat any flesh there. Some people have the misconception that God gave Noah permission to eat meat. Now, uh, I would say, technically, yes, he did. And I would say, technically, no, he did not. Now, who are you going to believe, me or me? Uh, I think we need to believe the Bible. I think we need to believe the work. By the way, the only place that you can find or the, 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 the place where there is permission given for the very first time to eat meat. Do you know where it's at? Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. And do you know that it was only to be eaten, even of the clean meats, it was only to be eaten for a short time. Did you know that? Did you know that whenever the children of Israel were in the wilderness and it rained manna from heaven every morning and they went out and they gathered it and God in Psalms chapter 78, he calls it the bread of heaven and the corn of heaven. He calls it angels food there in Psalm 78. And, but he said that some of those people were still unhappy and they were continuing to murmur and complain, and so God gave them their own desire. He gave them flesh. He actually gave them clean flesh. You find there in uh, uh, the story of the, the manna in Exodus 16, you find, and also in Numbers, you'll find that God in the evenings caused the quail to come in and land there in the camp, and they had all of the quail that they wanted. It was clean meat. All they had to do is just, it was, it was so deep, it was like three foot deep. I mean, you're not going to have any trouble catching a bird if they're jumping over each other like that. All you have to do is just sweep out and just take as many as you want. And I'm going to tell you, God gave them so much that it says in Numbers that they had enough that it came out their nostrils. Oh, I tell you what, once in a while, even of a good thing, I get sick of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I tell people I was born with not a sweet tooth, but a whole mouthful. But have you ever eaten something really sweet, like maybe seized chocolate or some of this kind of stuff, that, uh, and you're, you're eating it and you're eating it, you're hungry, you don't have anything else to eat, and you're eating it and you're eating it, and you finally get to the point where, Ugh, this stuff is repulsive. Do you know those people that work in plants like, uh, like over in Hackenstown, New Jersey, they have this uh, Mars plant or M&M's factory? And uh, do you know the people that work there, they give, them, they give them all the chocolate they want to eat whenever they're there. And you know what? Most of those people, after they work there a little while, chocolate smell is repulsive. Sometimes people work in an ice cream shop and they, the owner says, you can have all the ice cream you want while you're here. 
And the first thing you know, they get to where they can't stand it. One of my sons used to work in a McDonald's, and I tell you what, they said you can have anything you want while you're here. He got to where he couldn't stand anything they had to offer in McDonald's. They repulsed him. What I'm simply telling you is that before the flood, they were doing things that were evil. Not necessarily evil, but they were making good things evil. That's when you eat the seized chocolate until it comes out your nostrils. When you take one bite, I'm not calling that evil. Do you understand the difference? Whenever you are temperate in all things, it's okay. But whenever, or you got to be temperate also. You know, temperance means that you don't eat something that's poison or that's something that God doesn't want you to. So I've, so just to kind of let you know that I did not get this particular uh, idea all by myself. I want to share with you a statement. And so bear with me as I read this. This is from the book Councils on Diets and Foods. The diet appointed man in the beginning did not include animal food, not until after the flood, when every green thing on the earth had been destroyed, did man receive permission to eat flesh. In choosing man's food in Eden, the Lord showed what was the best diet in the choice that he made for Israel. He taught the same lesson. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt and undertook their training and that they might be a people of his own possession. Through them, he desired to bless and to teach the world. He provided them with the food best adapted for this purpose, not flesh, but manna, the bread of heaven. It says, it was only because of their discontent and their murmurings for the flesh spots of Egypt that animal food was granted them. And this only for a short time. Its use brought disease and death to thousands. Yet the restriction to a non-flesh diet was never heartedly accepted. It continued to be the cause of discontent and murmur. And you know what? It's even the cause of discontent today. Do you know that our church, as a rule, I don't care which one you go to, whether it be here in Buffalo or whether you go to Carriers or whether, I don't care where you go. There are some in the church that say you ought to be a vegan. And there's some that says, oh, you can eat all the flesh you want. And there are some, I even, I even pastored a church one time that at the church school, there was a church member wishing to do well, brought to all of the school kids a individual personalized pepperoni pizza. Meant well, but didn't know the difference, didn't know that that was pork. I'm happy to say the kids didn't eat it. But I'm disappointed to say that the woman that brought it was, had a little bit of hurt feelings. And I'm going to tell you that whenever we come to matters of differences of opinions, the first thing you know, we begin to not always act in accordance with God's will. Sometimes somebody says something that offends me, and I pray God that when they do, I respond how God would want me to respond. But I have to admit that I have not always done that, even after becoming a Christian. So, Going back to Luke, and I'm almost done here. Going back to Luke, Luke 17. I want you to, to think about something in that text again. It says, as it was in the day. Now, I could have, I could have talked about what people wear. I could have talked about uh, what people uh, do for entertainment. I could have talked about uh, what they drink. I could have talked about all kinds of things. And I could have had you mad at me on one side and the other side very happy with me. See there, you got them told today, didn't you? And then the other say, oh man, you pastor, you're way out of line. What do I do? I can't make you all happy. I'm going to try to make God happy. 
And I'm going to try to be faithful to him. In Luke chapter 17, I think we miss something really valid. In Luke 17, Jesus says, the days shall come when you will long to see a day with Jesus. Some people have sought after Jesus and just one look at Jesus and eternal life was given to them. In, in the Second uh, Peter 3, it says in the last days, scoffers will come. The scoffer is someone who will be kind of like doubting Thomas. Say it isn't so. I don't believe it. Scoffers will come. And they will say, well, where is the promise of the Lord's coming? You know, my grandma believed it and her grandma before then. And, and you know, he's still not here. And, uh, you know, is there really anything to that promise? And, and they scoff. And it says in uh, 2 Peter, and I'm not going to take time to go there, but in verse 5 of 2 Peter 3, it says that they are willingly, these scoffers are willingly ignorant of the flood and what happened. They're willingly ignorant. They deny that such a thing took place. And today, whenever you go to uh, like a public school system, they teach evolution. They, they teach, they don't teach a worldwide flood. They, they, they teach that, well, there's been floods, but not a worldwide flood. Couldn't be, couldn't be so. Well, I'm going to tell you that with God, all things are possible. And I'm going to tell you that God looked upon the earth and in, in uh, Genesis 9, he says, I'm never going to destroy the earth by water ever again. But he has said that I will destroy the earth with fire one day. And you know, we don't want to face that. We have all kinds of doctrines, Rob, just talking about the, in, in your Sabbath school lesson today. We have all kinds of teachings regarding that. People wanting to think that you're going to roast and toast in hell far for all the ceaseless ages. And some people thinking, no, you're going to burn up. And, 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 and sometimes people just don't know what they believe. And, and they look at the scripture and they're confused and they're wishing, oh, I just wish that Jesus could be present with me that I might understand. Jesus' words to the disciple, he says, it's expedient for me to go away because if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But whenever I go, I will send you a comforter, he says. And that comforter in John 16, verse 13, says he will guide you into all truth and show you the things that are going to be taking place. So whenever I'm looking here at Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah, the biggest trouble that I see is very simple. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, buying, selling, Nothing wrong with all those things, except as we do them without Jesus in mind. God is looking for us that our heart will be bent toward Him. Jesus can be found today, He can be found right here in this church. I've seen Jesus in this church. You know how I've seen him? I've seen him in the lives of some of you and how some of your actions, and I'm reminded of Jesus' words, in so much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So sometimes whenever I see what you do, I see Christ. Sometimes when I see what you do, I don't see Christ. And... The problem 
as I see it, that Jesus was telling his disciples here in Luke 17. You wait too long sometimes to make your decision for right. It's so important that we realize that the day is the day of salvation. The day is. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're going to be like Jesus said, you're going to be wishing for the day that the Son of Man was right there present with you. Do you long to see Jesus? I long to see Jesus. But I don't have to look very far because I see Jesus in the life of many of you. But I'm also disappointed that sometimes when I look, I don't see him. And I hope any time that you're looking at me, if you don't see him, I hope you're disappointed. But I also hope that you will be kind to me And let Jesus shine through your life that I might get redirected toward Jesus if you're not seeing Jesus in me. As it was in the days of Noah. So, you have my permission to get married. You have my permission to eat. You have my permission to build a new home. You didn't need it anyway. But as you do it, as you do it, don't forget Jesus. Would you stand with me? I'd like to pray. Oh, my Heavenly Father, you have been so long-suffering with me When I've been that one lost sheep of the, 90, of the hundred, you left the 99 to go in search of me. There's been times whenever, Lord, I, I'm sure I caused you sadness. And Lord, even though this sermon is not about me, it's about me. Because I admit to you, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'd like to honor you in all that I do. And if there's something that I don't quite understand, Lord, I pray that you would make me so steadfast that uh, I would uh, continually come to you and ask over and over, like the children's story today, that I would be persistent in coming to the Lord and ask for my salvation over and over. Lord, I don't feel very good today. I've done this. I've done that. Lord, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need you. And I'm going to keep on needing you. And I'm going to be back tomorrow asking you for help again. And, and I'm going to be back next week asking you for help. And Lord, I'm going to be back next year asking you for help. But Lord... I know that you're a loving God and that you know my needs and you know the need of each one here. Be with us today that we would bring honor to your name. Lord, as we spend time at the fellowship lunch together, I pray that you would bless our fellowship as we spend a little time looking at the rest of this video during the dessert time, Lord, may we realize that it's about dessert time in the kingdom. May we go home with you for it. In his name we pray. Amen.